evening and welcome to Beacon Baptist Church and this evening broadcast of our service. We welcome you and we are encouraged that you're watching. Well, let's get right into the scriptures, shall we? This evening we want to get right into what God has for us. If you have your Bible there, go to John chapter 14. John <clears throat> chapter 14. And I want to preach this evening on the sin of a troubled heart. Do you know that having a troubled heart is a sin. Now, I'm not talking about uh, a physically troubled heart. Maybe your heart is not very strong physically. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a physical ailment, and we understand that's not sin. But what I'm talking about is a heart that's full of trouble, despair. Uh, it's, a, it's a sin. It's not right. How do I know it's a sin? Because twice in John chapter 14, Jesus gives us a command. And here's the command, John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty definite command to me. Let not your heart be troubled. Can you see a parent saying to a child, do not mess up this room or go clean up your toys. Do not let your heart be troubled. It's a command. In verse 27, he says the same thing again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Twice there, he says, let not your heart be troubled. Now, it's a command. But not only is it a command, it's a command that we have a choice to follow or disobey. Let not your heart be troubled. We have a, we have a say in the matter. You say, well, it's uh, just uh, who I am. It's just my heart is troubled or it's because of the circumstances I have. It's, I can't help it. No, you might not be able to help where you come from. You might not be able to help how you look. You might not be able to help the circumstances that you find yourself in. But you can definitely help whether you have a troubled heart or not a troubled heart. You can choose not to have a troubled heart. So it's a sin. And it's a sin that we fall prey to often. It's a sin that we find ourselves oftentimes guilty of as believers, a troubled heart. Now, I want to speak to you this evening on that subject, the sin of a troubled heart. I want to try to define what a troubled heart is. And I want to give you some ideas about overcoming or defending yourself against a troubled heart. That's what we're going to speak on this evening. But before we go any further, as we like to do and try to make it a habit of doing, would we now pray and would you pray for me and would you pray also with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you now and we praise you and thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the gospel message that was preached in the morning hour. And uh, Lord, we pray that through the, through the broadcast and as the video remains online, that it would be uh, used as a tool uh, to be a great gospel witness for you, Lord Jesus. We thank you now and we praise you for your love and for your goodness. Speak to our hearts, we pray tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The sin of a troubled heart. Let's talk first of all tonight about the definition of a troubled heart. What are we talking about when we talk about a troubled heart? What is Jesus talking about when he talks about a troubled heart? Well, I think that it's important to note that he's not talking about a, a, a heart of sorrow. The Lord Jesus understood sorrow. He was a man uh, uh, of sorrow, acquainted with grief and sorrow. I, I don't think that when our hearts are broken through sorrow and loss and uh, trouble, that that's what Jesus is talking about. I don't think that Jesus is condemning a heart of sorrow, nor is he uh, condemning a heart of grief or pain or loss. Our hearts are oftentimes broken. Uh, we have children that sometimes grow up and through their decisions, they grieve us and they break our hearts. We have uh, people around us who through uh, sin and uh, giving themselves to sin and fleshliness and worldliness sometimes grieve our hearts. We find that sometimes we grieve our own hearts and we bring pain into our own lives and we, we are broken and we are sorrowful over the things we maybe have done or we, uh, the things we regret doing. And our hearts are sometimes grieved. And I don't think that's what the Lord is talking about. There's something beyond that. The word here, trouble, literally signifies to have a 
uncertainty, uh, an anxiousness. It, it has the idea of a commotion of spirit, a, a chaotic spirit, a woe is me, all is doom type of, uh, of attitude or outlook or, uh, or, or worldview. Oh, everything is just against me. Everyone hates me. Uh, woe is me. You're like that little person who said, uh, uh, everybody, nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I think I'll just go eat worms. <laughs> That's a troubled spirit. Uh, no, you know, uh, we find in, in the book of Genesis, uh, uh, Jacob saying at one point, uh, everything's against me. We find the prophets of old sometimes sitting under trees and saying, uh, it's enough, Lord, uh, just kill me, take me home because uh, everything is bad, nothing's good. We find Christians today, uh, pre-corona and during this COVID-19 pandemic, it's gotten worse, I think, where we say, oh, uh, the whole world is collapsing. Oh, woe is us. Friend, don't we understand that this world is not our home? <laughs> don't we understand that we're just a pilgrim in this life? And don't we understand that uh, this world is going to burn, this world is going to decay, this world is going to crumble, this world is going to be destroyed. Now, whether that be now or a million years from now, we cannot tell. But what we can know is that our hearts should not be troubled by these things because we have an infinite God who is supremely great and who is still in control. So, Pastor Rich, you keep giving us that message. I keep giving it because it's still, it's, it's, it's needed. Christians should not live in peril. Christians should not live in doom and gloom. Christians should not have troubled hearts. We might sorrow, we might grieve, we might hurt, we might experience a, a heart pain, but we should not have a troubled heart, a chaotic heart, a fearful heart, a faithless heart, an anxious heart. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And so a troubled heart, it's a terrible thing because it is a commotion of spirit. And now what will it, what will it do? How will it distress us? Secondly, this evening, the distress of a troubled heart. What will a troubled heart do if we allow a troubled heart in our lives? An anxious, faithless, fearful a heart that is full of commotion, what will it do? Well, I think we can see several things that it will do. First of all, I believe it will cloud our minds. It will cloud our minds to the truth of God's power and God's goodness. Look at verse 5 here. You're in John chapter 14. Look at verse 5. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, Thomas has been with Jesus. Thomas has heard the teaching of Jesus. Thomas has experienced the miracles of Jesus. Thomas is in the inner circle of the disciples of Jesus. He's one of twelve that are the closest to Jesus. Thomas should have known Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He should have known that because he's been hearing that and he's been being told that by Jesus and he's been witnessing Jesus prove that through his, not only through his teaching, but through his miracles and through his dealings with others. Thomas has had a front row seat to see and experience Jesus in his fullness. And yet, his mind is clouded to the truths that Jesus has presented to him because his heart is troubled. Can I remind you, Jesus tells them, let not your heart be troubled, because he has just told them previous to that, that he is going to die, and he's going to go up to Jerusalem, and he's going to die. And their heart is troubled. I'm going to leave you. I'm, I, there's, there's coming a point where I'm going to leave you. And he has expressed this truth to his disciples, and his disciples are troubled in their heart, and he says, don't let your heart be troubled, because I'm God, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, 
and nobody coming to the Father but by me. I need to go. I need to die. I need to leave so that I can send you the, the Holy Spirit so that you can be empowered for service. Let not your heart be troubled. But Thomas's mind is clouded to all that he's heard, to all that he's learned because of a troubled heart. You know what will cloud your mind to the truths of God's Word very quickly? A troubled heart will. It will, it will. it will just cloud it so that you don't even recognize the promises of it. Don't remember the truths of it. Oh, our, a troubled heart will cloud your mind to the truths that God has already taught you and already presented to you. That you believe, that you claim. But they will cloud, that troubled heart will cloud your mind to those things and will disturb your mind and cause you to live in a, a fog of error, a fog of, of uh, anxiety. I'll tell you what else it will do. It will not only cloud our mind, it will handicap our faith. Look at verse 8. Philip, here's another one of the disciples of Jesus, saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth thee. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Philip is troubled in his heart. He's disturbed. He's anxious of spirit. His mind is full of commotion and fear and faithlessness because he is troubled in his spirit in his heart. And what does he do? He's not only clouded in his mind, but now his, he's handicapped in his faith. He says, Lord, show me, show me. Now, what is the principle of Christianity? There are several key principles of our faith. One of them is that we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the opposite of sight. Sight is the opposite of faith. If you say, let me first see, and then I'll believe, that's not faith. That's confirmation. If you say, let me see something and then I'll believe it, what you're saying is, confirm it to me, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll believe it as truth. But that's confirmation. That's not faith. Faith says, I trust the one who has said it to me, therefore I'll trust it when I don't see it. That's faith. <laughs> that's faith. A faith is not, show me the, the proof of payment, and then I'll give you the product. Again, that's confirmation. Faith is, I'll give you what I have, knowing that you'll pay me when you can. That's faith. Faith is saying, I can't see heaven, but I believe in a heaven because I believe the one who told me about heaven. I can't see hell, but I believe in a hell because I believe the one who told me about hell. I can't see my sin. I can't see it physically in my life. Uh, you know, I can't see the physical stain of it on me. I can't see it uh, you know, uh, as a cancer that it is. But I believe what it, that it exists, and I believe in how destructive it is because of the one who told me so. I believe the one who said it. Therefore, uh, I, though I don't see it, I believe in the one who's, who told me about it. That is faith. Now, a troubled heart will cloud your mind to the truth of God's Word. It will, it will handicap your faith. And then, I think, most terribly, it will set a limit in our minds on what Christ can do. It will limit Christ in our own minds. Now, Christ can never be limited. He can do anything He wants to do. He has all power. He has all authority. In that sense, Christ is, is limitless. And yet, in our minds, we can limit what we believe God is capable of or what Christ can do. In verse 21 and 22, I think this is the, the situation here, when it says in verse 21 of John chapter 14, uh, he, hath, he that hath, excuse me, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. <clears throat> Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Now, what is this 
<clears throat> excuse me, what is this disciple saying? He's saying, Lord, I don't see how you can do it. How can you reveal yourself to us and not reveal yourself to everybody at the same time? How is it that you can do this? I mean, how is it that you are able to do what you're saying you're capable of doing? Now, again, this disciple has watched Jesus walk on water. <laughs> He's watched Jesus multiply bread and fish. He's watched Jesus raise the dead to life, made the blind to see, made the deaf to hear, made the dumb to speak. He has watched Jesus do incredible, miraculous things. And yet his heart is troubled. And in that moment of a troubled heart, his mind is clouded. His faith is handicapped. And what does he do? He limits in his mind what he believes Jesus is capable of. Are you limiting God? Are you with a troubled heart tonight limiting God's protection? Well, I don't know if God can protect me from the coronavirus. Are you limiting in this time of pandemic what God is able to do in you and through you and in your home and through your home? I don't know how God could really uh, protect me. I don't know how God could really use me. I don't know how God could really... I don't know how God's going to fix this mess that we find ourselves in. Well, friend, He might not choose to fix this mess. He might choose to allow the world to continue to just roll into chaos. He, he, I don't know what God's going to do through this pandemic. I don't know what God's going to accomplish through this. But I know that anything that God wants to do and anything God wants to accomplish, He's going to do it. And He can do it. And I'm not going to, through a troubled heart, presume that God is limited in His ability to do whatever He wants to do. A troubled heart clouds our mind to truth. It handicaps our faith. And it, it imposes upon God in our hearts, and only in our hearts, a false sense of limitation. The children of Israel did this. When they doubted God as they wandered in the wilderness, and the psalmist says they limited God, they said, can God. Friend, we ought to always be careful when we say, can God, and we ought to pause and reverse it and say, God can. We have an unlimitless God. He has no limit to His power, no limit to His glory, no limit to His strength, but a troubled heart will put a false limitation on Him in our hearts and in our minds that is most displeasing to Him and most destructive to us. The troubled heart, the description of it, or the definition of it, I should say, the distress of it. But then let's talk about the defense against it. What do we do to defend ourselves against getting a troubled heart and if we have fallen into that sin, what do we do to get out of it? How do we find a cure for a troubled heart? The defense against or the cure for a troubled heart. I think we find the answer here in verses 16 and 17. The Bible says there, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter. Now that's the Holy Spirit, and the word comforter, or the title comforter given to Him, describes what he wants to do in the heart of a believer. This word comfort, comforter is not that he wants to make you just feel good. It's the opposite of trouble. The idea of trouble there, chaos, he is the great stabilizer. Anxiety, he's the great <laughs> antidote to anxiety. And so I will pray the Father, he'll give you a comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And then look at what verse 26 says. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send him in my name, shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. The defense against a troubled heart is a 
filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, what do we mean when we talk about a filling of the Holy Spirit? When we get saved, we get all of the Holy Spirit. He comes and He indwells us. Now, there's a difference between indwelling and filling or uh, em empowering. One can dwell in a place and yet not have rights in that place or authority in that place. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit enters our life. He takes up residency in our hearts. Okay, Every believer has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the empowering, the endowment of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit comes when we recognize His authority in our lives and we receive Him as the authority of our lives. We say, you are, have indwelled me, you have entered me at the point of salvation, and now I give you the keys to the kingdom and I submit to you as the head of my life. I give you the authority that you rightfully have. I submit to that authority. I surrender to that authority. Now, how does one receive the Holy Spirit's filling as a Christian? Now, we're not talking about how to get saved or the, the, the incoming of the Holy Spirit, the taking up residency. That's what we're talking about. That's, uh, that's salvation. We understand that. But for Christians... How does one receive the Holy Spirit? Well, I think there are two main things. First of all, we must be careful never to grieve His indwelling. Ephesians 4.30 Grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? How do we, uh, how do we cause the Holy Spirit to become grieved so that He is not able to do in us what He wants to do? and to do through us what He desires to do, we grieve Him through our rebellion, through our refusal to heed His leadership and to follow His leadership, through our sin, through our, uh, through our, our refusal to submit to Him as He deals with us in our lives. When the Holy Spirit works in us, we have a, a choice whether to submit to that working or to refuse that working. If we submit, we benefit from all that he's going to do through that submission. If we refuse, we grieve him, we say no to him, we rebel against him, and we face the consequences of opening ourselves up to a great amount of sin and a great amount of backsliding, a part of that is a troubled heart. You want to get cured from a troubled heart? You want to stay on defense against a troubled heart, dear child of God? Then receive the authority of the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve His indwelling. But then I think, secondly, we must not only refuse to grieve Him, we must also not quench Him or quench His overflowing. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul says very pointedly, Quench not the Spirit. He, don't hinder His ability to work. Don't put out the fire that He's kindling in you. That holy fire, that cleansing fire, that purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. That empowering, energetic power that He wants to give you in your life. Don't quench it. Don't throw that wet blanket on the Holy Spirit fire of God. Don't uh, put out His... His, his holy fire that's, that He wants to stoke up within you, uh, that passion for God, that victory over sin, that, that desire to be clean and pure. Don't quench the working of the Holy Spirit of God. We can, through carelessness, quench His working. Quiet down his, his voice. Still His movement in our hearts. We can through just being ca too casual with God, too casual with His Word, too casual with the, with the great place of prayer, too casual with the, with the uh, assembling of ourselves together, too casual with His commandments. I'm not talking about gross sin. I'm not talking about deep Rebellion against God, as we would classify it. I'm talking just about being too casual in our Christian experience. 
Listen, there ought to be something in your life that is sacred about your Christian experience, that is sincere and meaningful and deep. Your walk with God is not just some casual stroll through the park with a friend. You're walking through this life with the King of kings and the Lord of glory. You're walking through this world with the creator of all that is and the, and the giver of life to your soul and the, and the keeper of that life. You would not walk into the presence of some great dignitary, great, great leader of this world, great... Uh, a great mighty leader of this, of, this, of this world that we live in. You would not walk into their presence and just be casual and p- pick up your feet and put it on the table and, and, uh, and just be, uh, you know, shoddy in how you're dressed and how you look. And yet we come into the presence of God like that. We come into the presence of God in the morning and we're just so casual and we're so careless and we're so belittling to Him. And we quench the Spirit of God. Friend, the Old Testament priests would come into the holies of holies. They'd come into the presence of God in the temple there. And they would come very low and very, oh, they would have looked at their life and made sure that they were clean and they would not want to enter in with anything that God would charge against them. They, were, they wanted their hearts to be perfectly right. Why? Because they were coming into the presence of God. We read recently in one of our studies on Wednesday night about Moses, how he came into the presence of that burning bush. And he came and he shielded his face because he he was not going to come in just casually before a campfire. No, he knew that this was a holy fire of God. The Holy Spirit wants to do something like that in you. He wants to to set you ablaze for God. He wants to set you on fire for Christ. He wants your life to be a glorious, bright testimony. But he'll never be able to do it. If we quench him, quiet him, put out the fires that he wants to start in us. Oh, we must be careful because once we quench the Holy Spirit's working in us and what he wants to do in us, once we put out the fires of the the holy fires of the Holy Spirit that he wants to stoke up in us, I tell you what, we open ourselves up to having a troubled heart. You've received the Holy Spirit in the sense that you've been saved. By faith, you put your trust in, the, in Jesus and you've received His Spirit to indwell you. Now, and allow Him to empower you with the endowment of His power. Let Him have the keys to your life, the keys to the kingdom. Let Him be the, the, the leader and the, the empower of your soul and life. Don't rob Him of His rights. Let him have your life and you'll be protected from a troubled heart. I, I, boy, we live in a life, we're, we're living in this time of pandemic and it disturbs me when Christians are just running around with troubled hearts. Friend, that's not how we should be. That's not what God intends for us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Believe and allow the Holy Spirit to be the comforter that He's been sent to be and to do what He's been sent to do. And He can only do that if you give Him the right to do it. Let Him have His way with thee, songwriter wrote. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit having freedom to do in the life of the believer what he needs to do. Trust him. Trust him. And give him the authority of your life. Lord, I submit to the Holy Spirit. I don't want to quench him. I don't want to grieve him. I don't want to open myself up to having a troubled, fear-filled, anxious, chaos-filled, restless heart. No, I want the heart that is not troubled because I know that I know that I know that the Holy Spirit is my comforter and He's doing, I've allowed Him to do what He has come and what He desires to do. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because a troubled heart is a sin. It's a sin to have a troubled heart. 
So, Christian, don't let your heart be troubled. God, we thank you and praise you for your love. We thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit of God. We thank you that you have given us this command. Let not your heart be troubled. It doesn't need to be troubled because you've given us the Holy Spirit to indwell and empower and to do all that we need in our hearts to comfort us. God, speak to your children tonight. Help us to not have a troubled heart. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for watching these broadcasts. Again, don't forget to join us on Wednesday at 6.30. And next week, missionary Turner, the Turner family to Uganda. And that's going to be a very special Sunday. Make sure to join us. God bless you.